Hi, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. My name is Steve Killoley, and I'm the founder uh, of uh, a local organization called the Manor of Hope, and also an organization called Friends of the Manor. Um, both of these organizations have one singular goal, and that is um, to enhance the quality of life for young men battling the disease of addiction. Um, we're a relatively new organization. Uh, we actually opened our doors about uh, November of last year, so we're just coming up on a, on a full year uh, in, in business, okay? Um, I'll let you know why I got started on this mission, okay? Uh, I think that's important for you to know. Um, there's a lot of people out there today who are capitalizing from a business perspective mm -hmm. on the opiate crisis and drugs out there, and that's not me. Um, it's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, Unfortunately, I got dragged into this world uh, unwillingly um, about 14 years ago when my son um, got stuck in the opiate crisis. Um, he lived a very normal life growing up, um, you know, pretty much a straight A, B student through all through high school, um, played three sports, and he was a good kid, well adjusted, and uh, had what I thought was a great life. And uh, he smoked a little pot uh, and drank a little bit in high school. And I wasn't really that concerned about it. Um, I didn't condone it, but I did a lot worse than that when I was growing up in the 70s. So, you know, I just thought it was a natural course of what he was going to be going through. However, what I didn't know was that his engine was just getting revved up. And when he went away to college uh, his freshman year, I noticed at the end of the first semester, his grades were not what I was used to. They were B's and C's. But I just kind of chalked it up to the fact that it was his first semester in college and he needed to adjust. However, um, at the end of his second semester, his freshman year, he had all D's and F's. And I knew something, you know, was definitely up. He came home to live with us uh, for the summer. And um, that's when I really knew that there was a, a really large problem. Um, all of a sudden, things were missing out of the house. Um, you know, and I didn't understand why at first. And then when I confronted him, he said, well, I'm taking a few pills and I needed to get, you know, um, some money. Um, and I said, well, ask me, you know, you don't have to steal things from the house. But things got progressively worse. Finally, I got him to admit um, that he was hooked on these pills. And I took him to a doctor who specialized in a drug called Suboxone. Um, and we tried that for a little while. And it actually didn't work at all. Um, I would take him there every two weeks to get a new prescription. And, um, and um, I would get up every morning at 5 o'clock in the morning and actually put the pill in his mouth um, to make sure that he was taking it. And um, I knew something wasn't right with him. So one day, I'm at the doctor's office, again, getting his Suboxone filled. And, you know, he goes in to see the doctor, and then he leaves. And, of course, Dad's there to pay, um, you know, because he had no money at the time. And I paid, paid the bill, and then I looked over and I saw the doctor and the nurse in an examining room still. And so I walked over into the examining room, and I asked them, what's going on with my son? You know, um, you see him every two weeks, and I know something's not right with my son. And I didn't understand at that point. I didn't understand anything about addiction, um, but I knew something wasn't right with my son. And the doctor told me, well, I can't talk to you because of HIPAA laws. Um, he said, you know, he's, he's of an age, you know, where I just can't, you know, share that information with you. And um, well, I said to him, yeah, I pay for this. I said, yeah. you think you could just kind of tell me what's going on? And he said, absolutely not. So um, I'm the kind of person, um, I don't like to take no for an answer. Um, so what I did was I turned around, I shut the door, and I stood in front of it, and I said, now you're going to tell me. And he said, what? And I said, now you're going to tell me what's wrong with my son. He goes, I told you, I can't. I said, well, I'm twice the size of both of you, the doctor and the nurse are in there, and nobody's leaving the room until I know what's going on with my son. I told him, you know, that you're take, you took a Hippocratic oath to help people. Do you really think I would sue you, you know, if, when you're trying to help my son? And that was the one of the worst moments of my life in the fact that, he actually looked at me, and that was the first time he told me, and this thought never came across my mind. He goes, he's a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea. And from when I grew up, that, that was the worst thing news I could ever hear. And, and it was the last thing I thought I would hear. I fell down on my knees and cried. I didn't know what to do. 
but he was very helpful, okay? He actually um, hooked me up with a treatment center in Maryland. It was one of the best treatment centers in the country um, and, caught, and, and cost like it was the best treatment center in the country. Um, our insurance, um, they wouldn't take it because he hadn't failed enough times yet. Um, and I said, what does that actually mean? Explain that to me. They said, well, he has to go through two or three other levels of care before he's eligible for this treatment. Although they took our insurance. They wouldn't let me go, they wouldn't let me go, have him go there. And I said, what does fail mean? I said, the doctor told me he's on the verge of death, that he's putting a needle in his arm 15 to 20 times a day. I said, what, is, what does fail, failure mean? You know, are you going to let him go when he's dead? I said, so I, we s spent all of his college money and, and put him in this program. And, you know, I'm a fixer in my life, so I figured problem's done. They're finished. You know, no problem. Well, that was just the start of a very long journey that lasted more than a decade. Um, and went through every penny that, you know, we ever made. My son <clears throat> was thrown around from treatment centers to sober houses, dozens of them, all over this country. Um, I know my wife and I and he were taken advantage by a lot of people who were making a lot of money on us and really had no intention of helping myself. Um, they were really just, you know, trying to make a lot of money, and um, they did. So I was feeling really bad. Um, you fast forward 10 years, and uh, <clears throat> my son, um, I'm now divorced. My son is living in Florida um, in a bus stop. He's homeless. Um, and, you know, I had lost pretty much contact with him. His mom would buy him a new phone every other week because he would sell it. Um, but it was her way of actually still being able to keep in touch with him, which was very important to her. And in the end, it ended up being very important for him as well. Because um, I actually found a program over in Italy that was very different than anything that was going on here in the United States. Um, and it's a therapeutic community concept. The program over there is four years. It's been around since the 1970s. It's very successful. Uh, however, I couldn't get him into that program. Uh, we tried for a long time, and thank God my fiance found another program like that in Canada. Um, and I, I had a friend, I called my son, and I asked him if he wanted to try and do something different. And he said, Dad, I want to do something different. I can't live like this. He'd just gotten off one of his binges where a good, it was a good binge for him because in the end he would get blitzed out drunk, walk up to a cop and say, I'm going to kill myself um, because at that point the cop by law has to take him to the psych ward in the hospital. He can get cleaned up and get some food. And so he was on a high and, you know, he, he didn't want to live like that. You know, nobody wants to live like that. And so he said, I'll try it. And um, I told him he had to go outside this country for more than a, a, you know, a couple of years. And he said, I will. So a friend of mine lived down in Florida. He drove across the state of Florida, picked him up out of the bus stop, you know, which is a very good friend, um, drove him uh, to his home and cleaned him up, put him on a plane, and um, got him to me. I flew up to Canada with him, and he stayed in that program for a year and a half. Um, and I'm happy to say that June 23rd this year, he just celebrated three years of sobriety. Um, and there's no reason on this earth that he should be alive. And because of that, um, I'm here today. Um, that, and in fact, five years ago, um, next week, my dad passed away. Um, and when I was in his hospital room, I knew that I was saying goodbye to him for the last time. And he was a very important person in my life. And as I saw him laying there, and I knew I was saying goodbye, you know, I said, when I'm laying there like that someday, what did I accomplish in my life? You know, what good did I do to be here on this earth? And at that point, I said, I want to do something significant in life. You know, not just what everybody does day in, rat race. I want to do something that makes a difference. And at that point in time, I didn't know what that was, but I found out, okay, when a house down the street from, from where I live went up for auction. Um, it was this old stone farmhouse. It was falling to the ground. And I walked into the house, and I turned to my fiance, Lori, and I said, I know what we're going to do for the rest of our lives. And it was just, you can call it divine intervention. I call it a happy moment. And I just knew what I wanted to do. And everything that had happened in my life, I feel today, happened for a reason. Um, and prepared me to do what we're doing with young men. Um, 
So that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm doing what we're doing today. Um, the Manor of Hope um, is very different than anything else out there in the United States right now based upon the therapeutic community concept. Um, it's a long-term program. Guys stay with us a minimum of a year, sometimes longer. We have two boys coming up on a year at the end of January, and they both want to stay longer. Their parents want them to stay longer. Um, and in the world today, long-term is not what people are doing. Um, everybody's 30, 60, at most 90 days, and it doesn't work. And everybody knows it doesn't work. The science out there will tell you it does not work. But it works if you're looking to make a fortune. There's a lot of people making a heck of a lot of money out there, you know, and not people not getting well. Um, I'll give you an example. There's one boy in our program right now um, who's been with us. He's just started his 10th month, and he's doing extraordinarily well. Um, he had been through 47 30-day treatment programs in the last eight years. Um, he died four times, been homeless, um, had lost all contact pretty much with his family. Um, he was at the bottom, and the treatment center called us, and they said, we think a lot of your program, and we've given up on this guy. He had been through their program 23 times um, at $30,000 a month. Insurance paid for it 47 times at $30,000 a month. Um, they said he never stays anywhere more than two days, but, you know, let's give it a shot. Well, like I said, he just started his 10th month with us. He looks like a totally different individual than walked in the door. He's happy most of the time. Um, he has a smile on his face. He's got a great job and a career that's part of what we do as well. We get all the guys really quality jobs. Because one of the things I feel strongly about, and it's why we named the company Manner of Hope Building Futures, it's easy easy to lock somebody up for six months, a year, and then don't teach them anything. They have no other skills. What are you going to do? You're going to go back and do what you used to do. It's what you know. So a big part of what we do is we teach the guys um, life skills and work skills. Um, so there are a lot of vocational skills that we do. The guys in the first two months, am I talking too much? Is that, no. Any questions? Or should I just keep going? Keep going. Okay. Yes. Craig, am I talking too much? No, no, no. <laughs> um, I, we only have an hour, so and I want to open it up for questions. So I'm going to zip through this as quick as I can. Um, so uh, we have um, first two or three months. The guys are with us. They just kind of chill. When I say chill, you know, it's not like sitting around the house. The guys are on a very uh, structured schedule from 6:30 in the morning till 11 o'clock at night every day of the week, okay? Um, there's no laying around. But we don't let them go to the outside world and start working like most sober homes that are out there. They just say, go out and get a job, you know, come back by five o'clock. Well, if you look at the disease of addiction, you know, that person is going to fail most of the time. Um, the recidivism rate in the United States is about 95% right now. So we know things aren't working. Everybody knows things are not working. We do it very differently, um, and the guys, they will, we have projects around the house, for instance, that we do. We just actually put in uh, horseshoe pits over the summer. Um, we are actually just put in water lines, public water lines into the house. We just built um, 12 raised bed organic gardens that we just put in. Um, there's all kinds of really productive things. And it's amazing to see guys. It's funny, too, because they'll sit and they'll bitch and complain. I don't want to do this. This sucks. You know, this is that. And then at the end, they're so proud of themselves. You know, you push them through that, and they're very proud. And in the therapeutic community, you see the guys really bond together, um, and they really make some really amazing progress. So um, those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, the other thing I just want to bring up to you is um, why you should all be concerned about this, okay? It's nice to know my story. It's nice to know that we're helping some people, okay? Um, but it affects everyone in this room. Um, I, I am overwhelmed by the amount of calls that I get every single day um, by people. And I, I can't tell you, I've lost count of the number of people that I've known that are dying. Um, you know, um, in this country last year, 64,000 people died of drug overdoses. 64,000 people. In Pennsylvania, about 4,700 people in, in Pennsylvania, over 900 just in the city of Philadelphia. And you look at that, you know, you're losing about 175 people a day in this country. Every day, 365 days a year. It is truly, truly uh, the crisis of our generation. Uh, it affects everyone and everyone. I'll give you two little quick little stories. 
that are just weird, but it just shows you how it affects in so many different ways. I live in a 55 and over development here in Phoenixville, and one day an ambulance showed up at my neighbor's across the street. Um, she had an older lady, about 75 years old, and you know, um, that she came out on a gurney and they took her away. I'm feeling like she had a heart attack, you know. I saw her husband about two days later, and I said, hey, is she okay? And he said, well, not really. And he told me that she had fallen and hurt her back. And the doctor would give her some painkillers, and she got hooked. She, she was an opiate addict, and she was getting ready to go buy some heroin. And the doctor started taking her, weaning her off of it, and she went through massive withdrawal. Um, so she was rushed to the hospital. 76-year-old, you know, opiate addict. Today, my day today, um, we got our 10th young man in our, in our home today. Um, super family, great, great, greatest people you'll ever meet. And their poor son, he's 32, um, has been arrested 15 times. Um, he just got done spending um, 15 months in jail. And nothing violent, always just buying drugs or stealing something to go buy drugs. Really super nice kid. You know, I went down to uh, the, the state prison in Chester today, waited, got him out. And, you know, obviously he was pretty excited. You know, he'd been in there for 15 months. And uh, I brought down with me, actually, one of the guys who lives in the house. And he actually volunteered. He said, can I go with you today, Steve? And I said, well, why? He goes, I know what it feels like coming out of jail. Because we picked him up three months ago coming out of the same exact jail. And he says, I'd like to be able to be there and support him and talk to him. So, you know, we were waiting there for him when he got out today. And I said, where do you want to go eat? Okay, because they tell me the food in that jail is literally unedible. I mean, they say it is horrible. It's not, not good, it's just terrible. So he said he wanted to go to Chick-fil-A for whatever reason. Okay, so I said, okay, what a first meal, no problem, we'll take you over to Chick-fil-A. And we're sitting there and the three of us are just having a discussion. And the lady, some lady taps me from behind and was sitting behind me. And she's about a 50-year-old lady, she was there with a couple of grandchildren. And she said, I've been listening to you guys. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your program and what you do? Um, her son uh, is an opiate addict. Um, they had just been on the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, Dr. Phil show, and Dr. Phil had sent him out to a treatment center in Texas um, called Burning Brush, and he left after two weeks. He was supposed to stay longer, and he left. He's back living at home with her, and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know what to do, you know, and so it just shows you it's everywhere. I mean, we're sitting in Chick-fil-A having something to eat, and somebody's there asking for help, you know, and that happens all the time. I probably spend 80% of my time helping people who will never come to my program. You know, we're not the perfect fit for everybody. People don't want long-term. It could be a financial thing. It could be that they're too old. We only deal with young men from 18 um, to 35. So, you know, I just helped place a 48-year-old CEO of a $200 million company last week in a treatment program. The place wanted them to come to us, but that wasn't the right fit for them. But there are treatment programs out there that specialize in helping professionals, um, doctors and airline pilots and things like that. So um, the problem's everywhere. Just last year, more than 300 million prescriptions were written for opiates. There's, a, there's enough prescriptions that were written last year that every man, woman, and child could have a bottle of opiates in their, in their medicine cap. That's a real problem. The United States is 4.6% of the world's population, but we consume 90% of the world's opiates. Think about that. I mean, it is a staggering, staggering, staggering figure. Um, there were more, I think the figure, and again, my figures are close. I can look at my card here and just get an exact figure on it. Yeah, but that's what it is. Five million emergency room visits last year because of uh, overdosing. What's the percentage again of it? 4.6% no, of the United States. Consume 90%? Yeah, consume like 90% of all opiates in, in the world. So if you don't think we have a problem, you know, and, 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 and it causes it, four out of five, four out of five heroin addicts start using prescription drugs, okay? Um, you know, four out of five, so 80% of people just start innocently taking some pills. Yes? What's, what's the reason for the age limit that you have? Well, in a therapeutic community, um, you want to have a bond. They become brothers. It's like a brotherhood. Um, and it's hard for a 20-year-old and a 55-year-old to have that bond. I mean, we work really hard during the week, like I was telling you. But on the weekends, we have a ton of fun. I mean, this weekend, we're going to the Eagles game. 
last weekend or two weekends, we were up in whitewater rafting. We go to Great Adventure. We go kayaking. We, we went to Villanova basketball two weeks ago, the home opener. Um, so we're always doing those kinds of things, and it's hard. Because one of the things that I, I do know is that parents can never help their sons get better. Okay, It just doesn't happen that way. It has to happen outside the home with other people. And they're probably not going to listen to a 55-year-old guy who has never been addicted to anything. And that's mm -hmm. me. Okay, All I can do is set it up. And the staff that I've hired is just amazing. And just so you know, my son is the assistant house manager and lives in our house with our guys. Um, and we have five full-time staff. We have a full-time chef. Part of what we do is we believe in mind, body, and spirit, okay? Um, and, and, and you see, if you look on other websites and, 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 and marketing literature, everybody says that in, in the treatment world. Everybody says it, because that's what you should do. You know, take care of mind, body, and spirit. It's all marketing, okay, for the most part, okay? We truly believe it, okay? We live it and breathe it every single day. So, like, body. Well, our guys are required to go to the gym every day for two hours, okay? Um, every day for two hours. And they just, we don't tell them they got to go. We load them in the van, and we drive there. My staff stands there and works out with them. Um, and they become a brotherhood. Like, they love to play basketball. They just convinced me tonight we're going to join a local men's league because they want they think they're really good, and they want to play in the local men's league, you know? And, again, it's them. I think it's a great thing, you know, that they bond together like that. Food. We have two amazing chefs, um, one of which is sitting in the back over there. Um, but, and we have two amazing chefs. We really believe that what you put in your body makes all the difference in the world. Um, we have a strict no sugar policy in the house. If you look at the um, science of it, cocaine, cocaine is, well, sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. And if you take a look on the internet, Forbes just came out with a study last week uh, just talking about the same thing and how sugar and opiate addiction are very tied together. You would never think that, okay? It's, you know, Forbes just came out with it last week, okay? Um, so we really embody the whole mind, body, and spirit in everything that we do. Um, and it's really working, you know, it's really working. We haven't had um, one person leave, actually, that's, that's a lie, we had one person leave the program, um, and we actually left twice. Part of his problem was, and he was a great great guy when he was with us, he was there about 17 days, and then he walked in one day and says, I gotta go, you know? What do you mean? I gotta go get drunk, you know? You know he said, I, got, I can't handle this anymore. Because we're very structured, they don't have the opportunity to use drugs and alcohol, which is a key, okay? Because your brain will heal itself given adequate time, okay? Um, the science is there, it will rewire itself and it will get better, but it will only do that if you stay away from that crap, okay, for a long mm -hmm. period of time, okay? And long period of time, you're still early at this if you're in, into it for a year, okay? You're not solved if you stay away from it for a year. There are studies that say as, as much as five years to get you back your full cognitive thought process, um, you know? But two years, to me, is a minimum um, to really get a really good running start. Um, but this boy came to, came to us, and we talked him out of it for a day, and then finally said, I gotta go. Um, he went to a treatment center, spent 30 days there, and said, hey, can I come back? We said, sure, no problem, because he was a great guy while he was there, you know? Um, and, you know, we believe in, in supporting our guys. When he left that first time, he called me about three days later, um, and it was in the middle of a snowstorm we had last March, and he said, Steve, I'm in big trouble. You know, can you help me? I don't know who else to call. And I said, sure, where are you at? You know, and he told me he was in a hotel in King of Prussia, and he was in really, really, really bad, bad shape. So I threw him in my car, we drove him, I drove him out to a, a, re, a treatment center out in Effort of Pennsylvania. A normal hour drive took like four hours through the snow. Got him in the program, he did his 30 days, wanted to come back, I said, sure. He did the exact same thing a second time. Um, at, 18 days or so, he wanted out. His problem was he had inherited a ton of money when his father passed away three years ago. Um, so he had options. So when I, he, I thought I would never see him again, you know, and I tried to keep tabs on him, and I knew that when he left us, he had been through three more treatment centers, 30-day treatment plans. He had been, um, uh, I think, six sober living homes. He would almost died three times in the hospital. And then one day, about three months ago, 
his mom and he called me from a treatment center and said, you know, Jesse, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that name. Um, he called and said, I'd like to come back. He goes, I've been to enough places around the country that I think this is the best place for me to get well. I, I don't think I can do it anywhere else. He said, would you take me back? And I said, no, absolutely not. I said, you know, we've been playing the definition of insanity and I'm not insane, you know. I said, you know, and I felt horrible in doing that because this boy, he was on the verge of death. Um, so I told him, I'll make you a deal. I said, what you just said, do you mean it this time? He said, absolutely. And I said, well, I've heard it, you know, several other times from you. Um, I said, you still have a bunch of money, you know, you still had about $100,000. Um, and I said, if you give up that money and put it in an escrow account for two years that you can't touch it, and only your mom can touch it, and she happens to be a financial planner, which made it even better, I said, I'd be glad to take you back. Um, and I knew there was no way that he would do that. Um, but to my surprise, he called me back the next day and he said he would. And he's been with us almost three months now. Um, and he's doing really, really fabulous. So the program is working um, and we're having some really good results. Um, so the mind, body, and spirit is everything. And it's also, we treat these guys like family. We call it La Familia. Um, they're like my kids, you know, I don't treat them any differently. You know, we love them, we eat dinner, and we eat every meal together at a big family table. And we do stuff together. It's not, oh, I don't feel like going to do that. Okay, get in the car, we're going. Um, you know, it's not a maybe, and the guys all have fun when they do push themselves, um, and they go and they do things. And we treat them with respect. It's very different because it's not a facility. Um, you go around the country, and you see a lot of places that are sort of like semi-hospitals, um, and they're just a number. You know, we're small. Most guys I ever want to take is 14 um, at one particular time. Um, we have 10 in the program right now. Um, we have two that are getting ready to leave, um, you know, in Jan end of January. Um, but we don't want to be big because we really want to help people. And I don't think if you get too big, you really can't keep the quality uh, uh, and excellence that, you know, that we want to provide as a service. Um, one of the things I want to mention to you as well, I'm going to show you just a quick video of the house because that's an important thing, is when the guys come to us, their self-esteem is, is terrible. I mean, no, no matter what they say, they feel horrible about themselves. They feel horrible about the things that they've done. They just can't help it. Their brain is not functioning properly, and they just can't help themselves. And that's one of the cool things that you see. Guys come to us. These guys are really broken. You know, they're, they're, they, are, they are hardcore people, and a lot of people have given up on them. And we don't give up on them. And it's funny, at the six-month mark or so, you really start to see the fog start to lift. And you're like, wow, this is an amazing person here. You know, and nobody took the time and effort to be there to support that person and help them. Um, and because we are there, it's amazing, you know, the things that they're accomplishing. And, you know, it's really cool dealing with young men. You ask why young men too. Um, first, it's what, what I know, you know, I, I went through it with my son. But the other thing that's really cool about it is, you help a young man. We have guys in our program now from 20 to 33 years old, okay? And you get a guy who's 20 or 33 years old, and you do an amazing job with them, and they work hard, because these guys are doing the hardest thing that you could ever imagine. What they do is not easy. It is harder than anything I've ever done in my life. And, you know, <clears throat> um, so it, it is amazing to see what they do. But in the end, a year's still not enough. So one of the things that we've just done is, we've now um, obtained a transition house or a graduate house. We have a very structured five-step program. And at the end of our five steps, you know, they're good to go, but they're not good to go, okay? They're not really ready to go out and face the world by themselves. So we have obtained a home that's about a mile away from, from our place, and the guys are gonna live there as they leave our program. They're all excited about what they're doing. Um, and it's really a healthy situation because we can monitor them still. Um, they will have a lot more freedom uh, so they can come and go and feel like, hey, I've worked hard, I get some freedoms. Uh, we're still going to keep an eye on it. My son's going to actually move over there and live with them um, so that he's there to support them. And it's great to stay in the area because they have their meetings. We go to AA and NA meetings four nights a week. And so they already have their sponsors in the area. They're going to meetings. They all have jobs. One of the things that I think is usually important, I touched on it earlier, um, is to not just keep guys caged up. We're, we're going to teach them how to work vocational skills. 
every one of them by that 90 day mark, we found good jobs for them. I'll give you a couple just quick examples because it's one of the things that we do that is vastly different. Um, is we try and understand in that first 90 days, what is that boy all about? Is he, you know, a blue collar type guy? Is he a white collar type guy? Is he smart? Does he like to think with his brain or his hands? Is he an introvert, an extrovert? Because what we want to try and do is match a job to his skill set and what he likes to do. Um, because I don't want them working at McDonald's or Burger King, okay? I want to find jobs for them that if they choose to do that job for the rest of their life, they can make a living, okay? So when they leave us, they have excellent jobs. To that point, I have one boy who's a Cornell University graduate in the program, smartest guy I've ever met in my life, uh, physics major. What do you do with a kid like that? You know, I mean, how do you get him a job? He's going to be bored in most things. Um, he's bored when I talk to him. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's really hard when you're dealing with somebody who's that smart. I was lucky enough to partner together with a, a company in King of Prussia who does genetic research on the disease of addiction. Um, and he's working in their research department. Now, it's not an easy sell to go out and talk to people in the community, um, but that's my job. I go out and I make opportunities. And the guys, we help them prepare resumes. It's a real job. We prepare them for the real world. So we do resume writing with them the week before the interview, because they have to go for an interview. I don't tell them I got you a job. I said I got you an opportunity. Um, and then we do mock interviews with them. And then we take them to the interview. And I always am the one that takes them, because it's the happiest day for me. Because when they come out, it's like they won the lottery, okay? You know, cause, and because I tell the employers, grill them. You know, make it hard on them. You know, they come out, it's the first time in a long time they've really felt great about themselves. So I'm always there, I always take a picture. Um, so it's kind of a cool day for me. Um, and so that's like one example. I have another young man uh, who's been with us two, almost, th almost three months now. Um, and he has a four-year degree in economics from uh, Villanova. He has his law degree from University of Pittsburgh. He's 29 years old, and he's an opiate addict, um, and it has a real severe problem. Um, but he's worked the program really hard so far. So I've partnered to get, what do you do with a guy like that? Okay, well, I found a partner in the community. And these are all local people, and, you know, and we're looking for support. So if you know people, and if you think these are good things to do, I'm looking for other partners in the community. Uh, I've partnered with a gentleman who, um, um, is actually on the Rotary here in Phoenixville, and he has a really cool uh, financial planning firm. And so um, next Monday, our young man is starting with him in financial planning. He's the kind of guy who wanted to wear a suit and tie every day. He's got a suit and tie. And the employers, it's a good deal for them because I tell them you're not allowed to pay them anything more than minimum wage, which is seven and a quarter an hour. So here, financial planning guy has got somebody coming to him with a four-year degree from Villanova, his law degree, and he's getting paid him seven and a quarter an hour. Great deal, okay? Um, now these guys are taking a little bit of chance. And this kid, I call them kids even though they're men, okay, um, is, is stoked. I mean, he knows that he couldn't have got that opportunity without us being there to support him. And we have tons of examples like that where we meet the kids where they are and get them jobs that they love and they can do for a lifetime. One of the cool things is, as they get to the end of the program, I've negotiated, like with the two boys that are ready to leave the end of January, they're dying to go to the new house that we have. They want that support, okay? They want that support because they know they're not ready. But I go to all their employers and I say, okay, how's he doing? And I know because we keep close tabs on it throughout the year. And each one of those two employers said, great, best employee I've ever had. I said, great, you want to double the salary so you can make a living, okay? <laughs> So the day they leave our program and move over to the transition house, they're going to get paid 15 bucks an hour instead of seven and a quarter. Um, in a job they already know, employers that love them, and they've got their feet on their ground again. Um, we make other things available. There's one boy who you know wanted to go to college. If you've been with us a minimum of six months, we make college available for you. Every Tuesday night, I drive over to the local community college with one of our boys drop them off there for three hours and pick them up at 10 o'clock at night and drive them on home. So we do a lot of different type of things. Um, what I'm going to show you one, one little quick video here is, as I started to say earlier, that when the guys come to us, their self-esteem is not at a high level. So to me, that's one of the most important things. You know, If we help to build that up, then a lot of things are possible. So we, we took this house, and with the help of my fiance. Um, we turned it into something that's pretty special um, for these guys. 
so they know that they're loved. You can't walk into the place and not know that somebody cares about you. And it feels like a house and not an institution. And it's right here in, uh, on Egypt Road here in Phoenixville. So I'll just show it to you real quick so you can get a feel for it. Is there a sound with that, Steve? There is. I just realized it's not going to come through our sound system, so you'll need to turn your volume on your uh, laptop. Can you help? You know what? You can the uh, chef slash computer with IT staffing over here. We just hit the enter twice, right? To get it started with a monitor. <laughs> this disease is insidious. It can happen to anyone young. This is just quick two minutes. Thanks. does make them feel good and they take pride in the home. There is no maid service. The guys are taught, I'm a really old school, um, sometimes my son says too old school and too hard. Um, you know, I'm the kind of guy who believes in not everybody gets a trophy. You earn everything in our program uh, and part of that you earn the right to live in a beautiful home like that because you take care of it. Um, we don't accept the fact that you don't want to take care of it. You have no choice, okay? You're part of the family. Family's doing cleaning today and that's what we'll do. Um, so we do, a, you know, a really, they, if you go in there, you wouldn't believe young men live in the place. I mean, just really kind of, kind of cool. So, a um, couple real quick things. I'm going to just talk about one more thing. I'm going to show you one more quick video, and then I'm going to open it up for some questions, okay? Um, what I want to tell you, because we have an 8 o'clock deadline. Um, first, I want to tell you that we need help, okay? Um, this is being done and financed not by a big corporation, but me. And my fiance, um, and we need help. Uh, it's a new organ. For instance, our Building Futures program. Um, I need more contacts with employers. You know, if you can think of people in the local area, we can't take the guys through New Jersey. 
Um, we're not going to do that, okay? But if it's in the local area, we're looking for more people to talk to, okay? For the right partners down the line. So if you know people who own businesses or manage businesses, my cards are here. You call me 24-7, let me know. The guys, I, I can't afford to do everything I want to do with the guys. And there have been so many generous people, and just throwing this out at tickets, you know, and things that you wouldn't, believe, you know, make, make their life. I mean, we were donated uh, four tickets to the Villanova game. You know, we've been go we've gone to the Reading Phils and the Phillies and the Eagles, things that you know not that big a deal to to most of the people in this room, but for them it's everything. You know, and we can't afford to do that for them all the time. Um, so if you know of things like that, we're also looking like we have a piano in the house. If you saw it, we have guitars. We're looking for people who want to come. We have a couple of the boys who really want to learn how to play music. Mm -hmm. And so if you know anybody, you know, who wants to do those kinds of things or mentor, if you know somebody who's really into, we take them over to the local Y and the YMCA, and we do some yoga and meditation, but if you know somebody like to do that, we'd love to have them come to the house and work with our guys, okay? Um, and the biggest thing um, is spread the word. You know, if you like what we're doing here, um, is spread the word and tell people, okay? Because that is the best way that we can help more people. Um, and, you know, you're welcome to come and visit the home. I'd be glad to give you a tour of the place. You call me and I open up the home to you guys uh, and spread the word about what we're doing. And I would also tell you one other thing before I just show you this video is um, <clears throat> we have put an agreement of sale together because I told you the most I ever want to do is 14 guys. When you come to the home, you'll see it could handle a lot more than that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to treat these guys with respect. But I don't want to turn people away, and I can see where sometime in the near future we'll be turning people away if we don't continue to grow a little bit. So um, I put a deposit down on a house on Pauling's Road. Uh, if you guys know where Pauling's Road is, it's an old farmhouse just like this one. Uh, it needs a ton of work, okay? Um, a ton of work just like this. Um, so um, not sure how we're going to fund the whole thing quite yet. We settled in January. Um, I think I figured out how to fund the house, but the renovations on the house will probably cost in the range of $600,000 um, to do the renovations, and this house costs more than that, okay? Um, so we're going to do a, um, some sort of GoFundMe site. I don't know that much about it. I'm trying to figure it out right now. Um, but on the way out, if we have somebody who could just put your contact information down on a piece of paper, we'll put you on our list and we'll contact you if you're interested to help in any way, whether it be a little labor or a little money or something, or you know people who can help, we're going to use it to help these young men that I'm going to show you in the video right now. This is a quick video, it's 13 minutes, um, but I'm going to show it to you because this is my extended family now, and these are the kinds of people that we're helping. Um, and so this will just tell you a little bit, me, me being quiet, about what we do. This disease is insidious. It can happen to anyone, young, old, rich, poor. It really doesn't matter. It's cunning, baffling, and powerful. You know, I don't think that anybody wakes up and, and thinks to themselves, when I grow up, I want to be a drug addict. It really was a recreational habit that turned into a physical addiction. And when I, once I was physically addicted, that was it. Addiction is a prison of the mind. Uh, you're beholden to a lifestyle that you hate, that you cannot stand, but uh, until life grants you a pardon, you're stuck there. Waking up every day wondering, am I going to die? Uh, waking up every day wondering, how am I going to get my drugs? How am I going to drink? How am I going to survive for the day? You know, it, it was tough. Like, it was one of those things that <clears throat> I, I really don't think anyone should ever have to go through. You're surviving, you're not living. And it's hard, very hard. My addiction took me to places I never thought I'd go. Um, my bottom was so lonely, the awful depression, um, living on the streets. I felt hopeless. Um, I didn't know where to turn. I felt like my life was over. I was giving up. My life was complete chaos. I was in and out of 47 rehabs, was homeless, had four overdoses, was in and out of jail, and there was just no hope. I would sit on the train tracks and like there was two thoughts in my head. Do I do I go get high or do I just jump in front of that train that's coming by? 
own, my wife Janice and I found out that my son was addicted to drugs. We were both, we were devastated and extremely shocked about the whole situation. I was, we always thought that this was going to be the end for him. Um, he didn't look good and you know, this disease is progressive and it only gets worse and worse. I personally denied it and was in such denial and I really did not realize what we were dealing with until I got my call that my son basically died of a drug overdose and had to be revived. At that point, I, 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 I'm changed. I'm changed forever. I got a call from a hospital that had just admitted my son. What I didn't know that they told me was that they had just taken him off the street because he was homeless and living out of a bus stop. And I did nothing that day. I went home and laid in bed and cried because I didn't know what to do. Um, it was the hardest day of my life. You know, I had to do CPR on Max right here in this house. I'll tell you about that. I had to, you know, I had to do. He, you know, he overdosed right here in this house, and we had to do CPR and you know, respirations, call 911. It was, it was, a sh it was bad. The hardest part. Yeah, just the realization of it, that, that he was actually an addict. And you want to believe what they're telling you. You want to believe it. Um, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, that's probably not reality, but you want to believe it. You know, our kids don't want to steal from us. Um, they don't want to steal from other people. They just need that drug because their brain's got all messed up. And then you have to let go. Some ways you have to let go. It's very hard. You know, I, I couldn't breathe. We, we couldn't eat. We, sometimes we didn't know where it was. Because he was in, he went to nine treatment centers. And he was, he ran from seven of them in four months. In a four month period. So, there were times where I would have to pull over on the side of the road just to get my breath. was, all right, now we need to get high, not only to not feel sick and to be able to function, but just so I don't have to think about all the horrible things I've done as a human being for the past two years. There was nothing short of jail or grief that would have stopped me from doing what I was doing. In the past, I went into rehab, not wanting, not wanting to get well, not taking suggestions, just blowing everybody off, not listening. But this time around, I really wanted to get my life together and move forward. I would do anything and hurt anyone to get what I needed. It just wasn't who I really am. I literally was on my knees in the shower, crying out for help, saying, I, I need to stop drinking, but I don't know how. I'm going either to jail or I'm going to end up dead. I decided one day to just call my mom. I'm like, Mom, I'm done with this. And that day, I got to spend the night at my house. And then the next day, I was off to rehab. And that's what started my journey. I could not find my son. I had no idea where he was. I, I just, I knew that something drastic had to be done or it was going to get way worse and we would be burying my child. So I started seeking a long-term, a, a long-term plan to save his life. We've been through many different programs, 30 days, 60 days, and this problem is, is so acute so difficult it can't be done in 60 days there is not a quick fix to this this is not you can you can just turn this off or on with my baby i didn't know what to do so i just kept trying and trying and hope was the thing i kept going until i found a long-term structured program that actually made a difference in his life and thanks to that program i have my son back today my son just celebrated three years of sobriety on June 23rd of 2017. I love my son, and I love the fact that he's excited about his life again. It's like yeah. he woke up. It's it's amazing to see the change in him. Right. He's like his old self. I don't think he wants to be in that place again. Hope for me is something that you aren't given. It's that little voice inside your head that says, keep going. There's something better on the other side. I've been 
been sober since March 22nd, 2017. I've been substance free since January 13th, 2017. My sobriety date is January 16th, 2017. December 14th, 2015. My sobriety date is June 23rd, 2014. August 24th, 2012. My sobriety date is August 9th, 2007. My sobriety date is November 26th, 2001. I got sober on February 14th, I came into this field after my own personal uh, recovery journey. I am a person in long-term recovery. And what I really wanted to do was just continue to help people have um, the successes that I've had in life. And to be able to see that hope, not just in the client, but in their families and in their loved ones, um, that we're really able to give them hope that, that there's still life after their, after their use. People would say to me, they're not going to make it, they're not going to be okay, there's no way this kid's going to be okay. And we now have kids that are doing things that I never thought they would be doing. That's what hope is. It's that call, completely unexpected, on your worst possible day at work to let you know uh, that someone has celebrated a milestone in their recovery. Today, it is really all about hope, that every single day, offers many, many bright moments for me personally. I see myself, you know, with a wife, with kids, have, have my own house, have my own car, um, and be able to provide for the people that I love and provide for my family whenever they get um, to provide for themselves and kind of give it back. I feel hopeful and optimistic right now um, for the first time in a long time. Today is Tuesday, August the 8th, and my son and I are going to go play golf today. I haven't played golf with my son in close to eight or nine years. Uh, so this is a watershed moment for me today. And if it wasn't for the program at the Mount of Hope, I don't think any of this ever would happen. Today, my future is, is full of endless possibilities. It gets better, man. I was, I was down at the dumps and like not wanting to live. And now all of a sudden, you know, I'm sitting in my backyard um, on a beautiful day outside, um, just trying to get another day sober and, and help somebody else out. My message of hope, is that the point at which I am in my life and the happiness and contentment that I have with where I am, it's not something I ever thought was possible. I didn't think I could be as happy and content as I am in my life right now. I got so much more than I ever wanted before I expected. Um, I thought I would just be clean and that would be it, but like, I've actually surpassed my expectations. I, I'm happy with who I am. I love the direction my life's going, and I really am excited for my future. I can say to you honestly that if it wasn't for this program, I think my son wouldn't be around here today. Hope to me is my son every day getting up and doing great, positive things in his life. He has a smile on his face for the first time in a long time. He has his family back. He has his life together. And to me, that is everything that hope is. Today, I'm grateful to have the opportunity work with my son, helping others on their journey to recovery. There is hope for everyone.
that's just a brief snippet of some of the cool things that are going on for Carnegie Road. So, mm -hmm. uh, very proud mm -hmm. of what you're doing. You guys have any questions? You say you're partnered with an investor. You got somebody in an investment agency in Phoenix, uh, A financial investment company. You know, a gentleman by the name I'll, I'll advertise his business because he's great. Fred Frederick Hubler. You know Fred. Fred. I mean, you know Fred. I, I figured it was Fred. Okay. Yeah. Fred Hubler. Yeah. Uh, I was going to throw the name Greg Sarian out there. Yeah. Okay. Because if you know that name, I'd like to get a card from him. I'm from the uh, I'm the uh, Good Samaritan Chiller. Right. That would be great. And yeah, yeah Greg, he's a major. He also is a major. He's the major contributor to the. Uh, no, that would be wonderful. I'll give you my card and okay. it has my personal cell number on it. Anybody else? And I have the call us yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, I was curious with regard to the treatment component there. Mm -hmm. who's, who's involved in the um, hands on work with the young man? Do you have medical staff? I mean, if, if oftentimes I think um, these young men might be um, turning to drugs or alcohol because of depression or bipolar illness or, or other mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So do you have somebody who's part of this, Absolutely. part Absolutely. of the team in that capacity? Yeah, you're exactly correct. Um, and there's there's a lot of studies that go on whether, you know, um, some of the mental disorders come first, you know, and they're self-medicating with the drugs, or a lot of people think the drugs cause some of those issues with anxiety and other things. And it's still an open question out there in the medical community. I will say this, we're not a medical facility. We don't have a doctor or a nurse on staff. Uh, two of our five staff are actually master's levels guys. Um, it's one of the things we do vastly different than most sober homes out there. We're not hiring guys who are just out of recovery for a couple months uh, who are doing this because they can't find anything else. The, our quality of our staff is amazing, um, and it's a big part of our success. But I do think, you know, I talked earlier about mind, body, and spirit, okay? And the mind part, which is what you're talking about, our guys as part of the program are required to go to a psychiatrist once a month, okay, who will actually uh, <clears throat> control and, 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 and deal with all the medications that might be necessary. They also go to nine hours a week of intensive outpatient with the finest therapy group in all of the Philadelphia area, in my opinion. Um, they do that on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights. Um, the other four nights of the week, we're either at an AA or an NA meeting. Um, so they're getting intense. Over the course of their time with us, they'll get more than 300 hours of therapy with a professional. Um, it's our goal, you know, we expose them to a lot of different things because I know I'm not smart enough to, I know that I don't know the answer what causes addiction, nor do I know what cures it. Okay, and neither does anybody else, no matter what they say. So we expose them to a lot of things, okay. Athletics, okay, that's really great. You would unbelieve when somebody's working out and all of a sudden they start opening up to you, real stuff, where they're out on the Valley Forge hiking and we had a guy last Sunday. It was like, wow, okay, where'd that come from? And it's good stuff, it's stuff they've been bottling up inside. Um, and that works for some people. AA or NA works for some people, but not everybody. In therapy, you know, a lot of good things happen in a group setting and we do individual therapy. They get an hour a week of individual therapy with a professional therapist. Yes. I have a double sided question. The first one is where do they go to their A and NA meetings? In Phoenixville at the clubhouse or the NA uh, meeting would, Friday night? At that, that would, well? Yeah, that would get that would get boring. Um, mm -hmm. so we try and mix it up. Okay. We have some favorites, like one of their favorites is to go on Friday nights to St. Joseph's University. Um, because it's a young people's meeting. Right. They're almost all college people and people their age. So that's kind of cool. Yes. Um, the answer to your question is we've been and go to the Phoenixville Clubhouse, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, we also go to Downingtown and Westchester and King of Prussia. Mm -hmm. We're all over the place. We want to keep it fresh. We don't want it to be stale for the guys. Um, and what was your other question? Uh, how is this funded? Is it funded through insurance? Or when they go there, I mm -hmm. mean, is there like, you talked about 30, I know, all the rehabs, 30 grand a month is standard right. fare right. anymore. Correct. But what, uh, how is it funded? How Unfortunately, it's one of the things that before I leave this earth, I'm going to try and help. Um, is insurance will only cover these 30, 60 day programs. You know, they come to a place like ours, not one dollar, not one dollar is funded. So it's privately funded. Um, somebody has to pay. Um, we also have a nonprofit that is associated with it where we've tried to raise some money to help people with certain things. And then uh, one of the coolest things throughout this journey that I am on 
is that these angels have come into my life here, and, and it's people, you know, I have one angel in the back left over there who's come into my life. I didn't know her a year from now. And, and the amount of support and things that she does for us, Linda, uh, who is one of our, she's not really staff, she's just a friend, um, and the things that she's done, and dozens of other people who have done things that are really cool, and some really cool financial stuff to help guys who can't afford it. In other words, yeah, if they can't afford it, they're still welcome. There. That's what I mean. I mean well, let's they, put it yeah. this way. The answer is maybe. I, I, we can't, we yeah. can't do it for free, okay? Mm -hmm. It costs a lot of money to offer the services that we do. And Phoenixville Federal Bank gets a large check on the mortgage every, every month <laughs> from me. Um, and I have to pay for it somehow. But we usually find a way. And one of the things I would tell you is this. If, if our place isn't the place, I will find them. I know enough people around this country I've, I, like I said to you earlier, I spend 80% of my time helping people who are never going to come to our program. So, you know, I won't turn a lot of businesses, well, you know, hey, uh, that's not a good fit, click, never do that. Okay, like I said earlier, I just placed a 48-year-old CEO of a $200 million company in a great program. That took me, you know, probably 10 hours of my time. And, you know, I believe in good karma and bad karma. If you just keep doing the right thing, hopefully good things happen. Yes? I'm just letting you know I might be one of those people that call you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I mean, it'd be because, great. You know, I came in here. I think I love what you're doing. Okay. Great. And I just want to say you. thank you. You're it's welcome. very important, and you know, congratulations, and I think it's just amazing. Um, but the other side of me came here hopeful for a family member, and mm -hmm. the other side of me now is just like so defeated because number one, he's too old. Number two, we don't have the money. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately what I think is so sad and disruptive about this disease is there's not hope for everyone I mean point blank we just need to say it right. if you can come to your program I could totally see my family member succeeding totally could mm -hmm. I know this person I know how his head works his personality but in the system that he's in right now mm -hmm. I hate to say there's no hope for him but there's not I, I would I would that's how I, I would uh, respectfully, so I, I, say, I, I res want respectfully, your I would be glad to help. Yeah. I would respectfully say I disagree with you. The reason mm -hmm. the name of the business is the Matter of Hope, because everybody had given up on my son, mm -hmm. and the fact that he's still alive today is the reason we call it Matter of Hope. There's hope for everyone. I mean, you, you may not think that. I don't I, think we've given up on our person. It's just we're waiting to see. We're hope. I don't. We don't know how. We're yeah. stuck in yep. it. Yep. I'd be yeah. glad you call me. Yeah. What did you do about the families of these young men, like Naranon for the family members, this kind of thing? Because family, you know, most of the time, I, so I'm, I'm thinking of the huge amount of publicity that Andy Reid got, the Reid's got, yes. when, and they were over in Melbourne, and they uh, lost one they son, were they were in both the family program. Mm -hmm. If you go into those places, Karen, all those places, you're forced to go into, the family is forced to go into yeah, the, the only problem with families. programs like Karen, and it's a great 30-day program now. They do like a, some extended care, 60, 90 days. Um, the problem is it's only 30, 60, 90 days. Mm -hmm. One of the things, how much are you going to cut? And it's one weekend a month, typically. So if you're there for 30 days, you get one family session. You know, If you're there longer, you can get more. But what are you going to accomplish in that period of time? If you notice in the last video I showed you, there's a lot of families in there, okay? Um, we uh, have done an amazing job, I think, of reincorporating. It's a big part of what we do, is we reincorporate the family together. There was one family in there um, who the sister hadn't seen his bro brother in eight years. Um, they're up there, spent an entire weekend with us uh, over Father's Day weekend. Um, Christmas is coming up. Christmas is a big time for families. So what we're doing is on uh, December 23rd, we're actually going to, at 1.30 in the afternoon, start a Pollyanna at the house. All the families, brothers, sisters, everybody is coming, okay? Uh, at 4.30, we're going over to the Colonial Theater as a group. There's going to be 40 or 50 of us, and we're all going to watch It's a Wonderful Life together, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to walk across the street. A good friend of mine uh, and one of our great partners in our program is a gentleman, if anybody knows him locally, he owns Majolica Restaurant, Andrew Deary. Um, Great guy, he's hired one of our guys, says he's the best employee he's ever had. It's worked out wonderfully for everybody. He's closing the restaurant for us. Um, and so we're gonna walk across the street from the Colonial Theater, we're gonna have dinner there, uh, a holiday dinner, just us in, 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 the, in, in the restaurant, and then we're going back to our home, Manor of Hope, 
uh, and have coffee and desserts. Um, so we do a lot with the families. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard. We have one boy from Ohio, but they've flown, they've everything, they've flown in for everything we've done so far. Um, and so we work real hard at the whole family thing. And there's also a family session available with, to, to your point, with the professional therapist. <coughs> Besides what we do, um, we have family sessions that, that are run by the therapist. Um, but um, you could see a lot of pictures, like where the one gentleman was saying that he's going to go out and play golf with his son. You know, he's doing well in the program. He's in his ninth month, I believe. Um, and so we make it regularly. They like to go out and play golf, and we make it happen. Yes. Sorry, just one more question. Sure. Um, have any of your young men come to you as the first resource, or have most of the young men come to you after going to several other, several rehabs? Um, I would tell you nobody has come to us as the first source. I don't think, no, nobody has. Um, because our guys are pretty hardcore. They're not guys smoking pot occasionally on the weekend. You know, if you're going to commit to do something for a year of your time, you got a pretty serious problem, you know. So, you know, they've all, some have gone from 47 times to two or three, but they've all gone somewhere first and, and not succeeded. Well, Greg, you got a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. all right, well, I thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. We ran over by about 10 minutes. But my cards are on the table. There's some brochures on the table. Please feel free to take them and call me at any time. And again, I wasn't kidding when I said it's an open house. You're all invited. Just need to call so I know that uh, I would be there to kind of give you a little tour. Thanks again. Have a great Thank night. You. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thank